Can we go ahead and um, pray for this morning's service? Heavenly Father, <clears throat> what a good and gracious God that you are. Thank you for this morning. Just even the, the commitment of our people to want to serve like this is, is pretty awesome. And so we give you praise and glory as we uh, head into this uh, set of messages in between these series, Lord. Pray that, that you would bless and you would lead us and guide us. Uh, put me to the side so that the words that are spoken today are your words, that you would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, uh, today, uh, next week, and the following week, we'll be giving a series of messages that are uh, they're not necessarily thematically tied, um, uh, but they are messages that I sense as, as best as I can that the Lord is kind of leading us to, to give to you. Uh, we just finished Heaven on Earth. And the next series won't be until uh, September 1st, which is going to be on welcome home. The sense of like, man, like, like I want to go home. I want to be home. We're going to do an eight week, a four-week series on that. Um, but today, uh, we're going to be talking about our plans and God's plans uh, in, in terms of guidance and wisdom from God. And then um, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, what it means to be a good and faithful servant of God. Um, and that's going to be uh, in light of the fact that Diane Hurst, we're going we're to celebrate her retirement and her many years, 39 years of service here. We're going to celebrate her. And so that message on well done, good and faithful servant seems to fit who she is. And so we want to honor her that way. Uh, and then the following week, Pastor Isabella is going to give the message on 818 on the sustainability of God and how do we maintain that strong relationship with the Lord. Okay. Well, uh, so this morning, I want to talk about wisdom, how to gain wisdom from God, how to ask God for wisdom. Um, we make decisions every day. Uh, hopefully, most of them are legal, um, uh, but perhaps most of them aren't very wise. And so we need guidance. Uh, you know, did I say the right thing? Uh, is this a good purchase that I made? Is this the right career path? Um, is this the right person to marry? Is this the right amount of freedom to give a child? Is this the best use of my time? It, was it right not to marry that person? Uh, was this the right person to confide in? Maybe I shared too much. Maybe I need wisdom there. And, you know, could I have done more to help that person? Now, these are not rocket science types of issues. These are not life-threatening. But they are concerns in our lives, and we want to be wise in the way that we live. And so this morning, I want to help us to do that. Um, very often, we need wisdom. Um, the Hebrew word for guidance in the Bible is actually a very interesting word. Uh, it's, uh, it's takbula, which means rope pulling. So, so guidance in the Bible, the way that God configures guidance, is that uh, it's rope pulling, meaning that we've got to like, like pull uh, uh, life situations where we navigate through things. Um, and so we, we need some of that. So it's interesting that the word guidance is... Um, um, uh, is the same word uh, as, as rope pulling. Um, so today we're going to talk about that. All right, so let's go ahead and, um, and, and look, at, uh, look at God's word this morning and uh, answer this question, how do we get guidance from God? How do we get guidance from God? Um, J.I. Packer, well-known scholar and theologian, actually kind of describes guidance this way. Guidance, like all God's acts of blessing under the covenant of grace, is a sovereign act. Not merely does God guide us to show us his way, he wills that whatever happens, whatever mistakes we make, uh, we shall come home safely. Uh, slippings and strings, there will be no doubt, but their everlasting arms are beneath us, and we shall be caught, rescued, caught, uh, we shall be caught, rescued, restored. Uh, this is God's promise. This is how good he is. So uh, J.R. Packer, in his, in his book, Knowing God, uh, basically sets a, a, a canopy of definition for the gu guidance of God. It's not random. It's for us, not against us. Um, so we can ask. We can ask God for it. So uh, the first thing that I want to say this morning in regard to the, the guidance of God, the wisdom of God, he gives us wisdom. All we really have to do is ask. Um, we find this in James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So this is the kind of God that we follow, that he wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us guidance. All we have to do is ask. And you might ask yourself, why am I so hesitant? Why am I so hesitant to just ask God? Yes, I can go to Google, right, as we heard this morning. 
Uh, I could consult the latest uh, magazine in terms of, you know, certain kind of guidance that we need. But, I mean, wouldn't you rather go to the God of the author of Google? Uh, wouldn't you rather go to the, the, the source where it all happens, right? And so let's ask God for that wisdom, and we can totally do that. And, and if, if there's a hesitation, maybe you want to explore, why am I hesitating? Is it because I feel like I know t- enough? I don't need God. I don't, I don't need people. I can do this. And that's fine, but that's a journey in itself to kind of unpack and understand, okay, why am I so hesitant to seek the wisdom of God if he's willing to provide it? Um, second thing I, I see uh, in the scriptures is that God's guidance often comes to us paradoxically. Uh, part of the reason, perhaps, that we hesitate in asking God is we feel like maybe if he gives us an answer, we don't get to be in control. We want to control the solution, so maybe we don't want to ask God because he might ask us to do something or guide us in ways that doesn't make us feel good. Well, here's the interesting thing about the guidance of God. It's often paradoxical. It just seems the exact opposite of the way we think. And let me give you an example of what that looks like. In the Bible, it actually says that to humans belong the plans of the heart. So we create our plans, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. So this verse seemingly says we can basically make choices, we can make plans, and that's free will. But in the end, God is the one that guides your tongue. God's the one that guides your words. It's like, oh, okay, I thought I had free will, but it seems like God's determining things. That seems paradoxical. Can they both be actually true? And there are plenty of passages to support this. The lot is cast into the lap, like when we cast lots, right? But it's, every decision is from the Lord. How can that be? That's paradoxical. It seems that, that's kind of opposing each other. A, a lot, that means it's random, right? Like, how does anybody know that? It's just random. I, I, if I pull the short stick and, and I've got to do a chore, oh, man, that was random, right? And yet the Bible says, actually, the lot is cast. That may seem random. But the Bible says that every decision is from the Lord, that God actually fixes the result. In other words, Every coin toss that comes out head or tails, God knows. You, you're tossing the coin for sure. You're exercising free will, but actually God knows what the results are going to be. It's kind of paradoxical. Um, here's another verse that says that, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. I mean, if there was only one of these verses like that, I might say, come on, let's not make the exception the rule of Scripture. It doesn't seem to be one verse. <laughs> there seems to be multiple verses that support this notion that, yes, we have, we have free choice, we make choices, and there's a freedom there. But at the same time, it looks like God actually fixes the result. He seems to know what's best for us, and he actually has the result in front of us. And that's paradoxical, isn't it? God's guidance and his wisdom often comes that way. Um, Matt Chandler, who is a well-known pastor reformed pastor uh, said this about knowing or trying to figure out God. Trying to figure out God is like trying to catch a fish in the Pacific Ocean with an inch of dental floss. It's like, whoa, wow, that's deep, you know? I mean, I'd like to think that, that God is a certain way. I'd like to think he's a little predictable. I, you know, I feel like I know God, but there does seem to be this mysterious side to God that we're not actually supposed to know. And perhaps that's the rub, is that maybe that unknown side to God is really why we should be dependent on him because he knows best, right? So on the one hand, yes, we have free will. We could make choices, and I hope you make plans for retirement. I hope you make plans to you know, make sure that your children are educated the best or, or plans or guidelines to so like, here's the kinds of people that are, that are the, the characteristics that we like and, and uh, you know, son or daughter that if you want to get married, hey, we have a plan where this is a wonderful list of characteristics for you to consider as opposed to these. Right? So planning is good. Um, but I think there's some shred of truth to this, right? We're not quite sure. It's like, hey, do we, have we really you know, figured out who God is? Um, in the Bible, this is another example of, of like, this contradiction, this paradox of like, is, it, is man doing it or is, is, uh, you know, is God doing it? Uh, in this kind of popular, well-known story about how God asked Jonah to go to uh, Nineveh to kind of preach the word. And Jonah uh, decides, man, I don't like the Ninevites, you know? I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they act. They've been really bad to my people. They're cruel. You know, I don't want them saved. I'm going the exact opposite direction. So God told (laughs) Jonah to go to Nineveh to save them, to preach God's word. And Jonah goes, no, uh I'm going the other way. And he gets on a boat. He's just literally like running from God. And while he's on this boat, uh, 
you know, the waves are thrashing and, and, and the sailors on the boat are really scared. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, what we did wrong. You know, maybe that's why God is so upset. And then they decide that somebody did something wrong and that God is very upset about that. And guess what? They draw lots. <laughs> they draw lots. And guess, guess who got the short end of, of that draw? Jonah, right? And here's what the sailors decide. They decide, dude, like, you're killing us, man. Literally, you're killing us. We're going to have to get rid of you. And they, they, the sailors, this is uh, Jonah chapter 1, verse 15, says, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. It's like, so, so the sail, sailors somehow had the wherewithal to understand that God was not happy about something, and it was, it was something that, that they had done, and then when they drew lots, somehow, right, because God's in control of the, of the lot, Jonah gets kind of incriminated. He confesses, he admits it, and what do they do? They throw him overboard. This is Jonah chapter 1, verse 15. But then when Jonah recounts what happens to him, in retrospect, he says these words. You, God, hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Hey, wait, we just read in the Bible, it was the sailors that threw him over, over, the, over the boat. And Jonah's like, no, you did it. I, I know, I know. You were not happy with me. I was not obedient to your calling. So which is it? Were, were, was it the sailors or was it God? It seems very paradoxical, right? So, so the guidance of God can be paradoxical. And I want to kind of hold that tension for a little bit and, and see if we can resolve a little bit uh, moving forward. Uh, even Charles Darwin, a, a well-known evolutionist, I mean, the father of evolution, even says everything in nature is the result of fixed laws. It's like, wow, do we, can we ever have free will in the midst of that? There's that tension. How do we resolve that tension if there are things that are fixed and yet we seem to have free will? Um, in the uh, uh, story of Oedipus, um, the, uh, the male figure, Oedipus, um, is told... There's this future prophecy that he's going to kill his father and, and marry his mother. And he doesn't want to believe the prophecy. It, it seems to be fixed in time. And he does everything he can to change his destiny. Like he manipulates situations. He talks to the right people. And throughout the, the story, we're told that Oedipus knows that this is the future of his life. And he does everything he can to, to change it. And, and sure enough, he ends up killing his father and he ends up marrying his mother. Example of kind of fixed destiny. Um, now, you may not know who Dr. Brown is, uh, played by Christopher Lloyd in Back to the Future. Uh, you, know, his whole, you know, his whole outlook on life is that, you know what? The future is not set, man. You know, in fact, that's your destiny. His philosophy was your future is whatever you make of it, so make it a good one. It's like, all right, are things fixed and I can't change the result? And yet we're told even today in popular society that, no, you have choices. You can determine the future. There's a tension there between our free will, the plans that we make, and the plans that God has for us. How do we resolve that tension? And that's kind of what I want to help us to do using the scriptures is, you know, how do we resolve the tension between our free will and God's determinism? Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be naive and and thinking to myself as, as, you know, you're the pastor of the church and you probably think about this stuff, you know, a lot because they're, they're both in the Bible. I, I'm, I'm like, does the everyday person think about this? I don't know. Maybe you wouldn't use these terms, but I'm willing to bet that you would like some guidance in your life and you would like some guidance as to how do I do this? Do I talk to this person about it? Do I buy this? I'm, I'm willing to bet that we all want guidance, but in the back of our mind, it's like, okay, but God's in control, Right? Do I, do I disrupt that guidance by acting too much? If I get too aggressive, if I get too ambitious, is that, does that negate kind of God's plan? So I think it's kind of a legitimate thing to, to ask ourselves is how do we resolve this tension between our free will and God's determinism? Now, this past week, um, as I often do, I talk to people about this tension and, and, I, and I get their feedback. And what I really appreciate is when people not just give me feedback, but they give me illustrations. They give me like stories or examples how they might view this. So this one actually comes from Pastor Stephen, right? A wise Pastor Stephen. And uh, he said this. So the way I see it, it's like we're all on this cruise ship. We're all on this cruise ship and we're all headed to the same place, a good place, 
God wants to, because that's the fixed part, right? We're all headed to, the, to a really good place. It's a fixed destination because God is a good God. But while we're on this cruise ship, which is a big cruise ship, we have all kinds of freedom. Like we could eat, you know, we can play shuffleboard. We could stay up late at night and, or go to bed early or not eat. We've got all these wonderful freedoms that we have. It's just that, you know, on this, on this cruise ship, just, just, you know, just don't go swimming. You know, just don't, don't, just don't go over the edge because, you know, you might hurt yourself. So uh, that was actually quite helpful. It's like, okay, okay, there's that fixed part. There's the destination that we all have. But then there's that freedom part within certain confines, right? So that's very reasonable. Um, but then I, I had, I think, even a better example from a friend uh, that, that I was meeting with. And he said, well, you know, I need to not think about any of this kind of free will determination stuff until I became a father. He said, when I became a dad, I began to see how this dynamic is actually quite good, that we know that God is in control, and yet we have freedoms uh, within that control. And he talked about how his, uh, how his new uh, infant son is, I think, like almost two now, and uh, he's watching his son, like, run around all over the place, right? I mean, literally, but, but you know, the son has no idea that, that his dad is watching him, Right? And he says to himself, man, I, I've never had a kid before, but I just know I never want this kid hurt. I'm watching this guy, you know, is he going over kind of like ragged edges of the table? Like I'm, I'm almost like ready to dive so that he doesn't get hit with that corner. He, he has, the, the, my son has no idea. My son has no idea that I'm actually thinking about him. I'm trying to keep him safe. And yet the, the child is making all this decision, has all this free will, but the father the entire time is thinking, all right, I don't want you getting hurt here. I'm going to make sure you eat there. And he's, he's, he's got such a perspective, uh, a, a kind of, of a fixed perspective on how he wants his, his son to grow up and kind of protect him, so to speak, right? But the son has no idea that this is going on because, you see, he has all this kind of freedom. So I thought, I thought that was helpful. Is that helpful, by the way? Is that, <laughs> okay, all right, does that, like, resolve a little bit of tension, right? Well, there were two other people that came up with it, so I can't take credit for it. But, man, I, I was really helpful for me, all right? So, all right, with that in mind, then, let's, let's go over a few things here from, you know, guys who have thought about this a really long time. And uh, this is, uh, I believe this gentleman's name is uh, Peter Kreft. He's a philo- uh, uh, professor of, of philosophy at Boston College and a Christian apologist. And he says this, If God is not love, but only knowledge, then it is difficult or impossible to see how human free will and divine predestination can both be true. But if God is love, there is a way. And that really helped me. I hope it helps you that if it's just about control, it's kind of neutral, right? Oh, man, like, why is he always trying to control me? But if that control and power is there, and it's guided by love, like, like the father who's kind of overseeing his son, why wouldn't you yield to that? If you knew that that control and that determinism and predestination is, is anchored in love, isn't there a certain amount of trust and yielding and surrender that we can actually respond to? Right? And this is kind of you know, Peter Kreft's point here. In other words, freedom and predestination are two sides of one coin. If love and power were not one, we would have the classic standoff, an unending conflict between the two. Once you see the center, which is love, Everything else falls into place like spokes in a wheel. Isn't that true? That if, if the control of God, if the predestination of God or the foreknowledge of God is anchored in his perfect love and his perfect wisdom, and somehow in the ways that you are living your life, he has determined kind of a fixed result, this is going to be best for you, but you're still making decisions here, good or bad, but eventually he's going to get you here. Is that a bad thing? Or are we such control freaks and kind of self-reliant you know, reliant folks that say, hey, you know, God, I, I appreciate your, your assistance and your offering help, but I got it. I got this one. That's a tough argument. So I want to share with you this morning to consider that. Would you kind of prefer to leave things to your own devices with your own benefits and consequences of the choices that we make? Or is there some level of comfort in knowing that, okay, you know, this perfectly loving, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God is actually overseeing my life, knowing what's best, that he's got this kind of fixed thing going on, might I consider yielding and giving my life to the one 
who is like that. So something to consider for all of us in the room. Um, Dr. Tim Keller kind of summarized it this way. The Bible does not say that our choices have no connection to our destiny or that our choices determine our destiny, but that God in his sovereignty relates our choices partially to our destiny, but he is the one who fixes everything. Therefore, we are completely responsible and completely free, but we can relax because God has the final say. So I don't know if you're kind of an a anxious person by nature and like every decision you make, you kind of you, you doubt and you, and, you, and you question it and you think, oh my goodness, did I make the right decision? Was this going is, is to cost me my kids? Is it going to cost me my life? Yes, it's very anxiety causing, but in the end, God is going to bring about good in your life. He wants to, especially those who follow Christ as, 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 as your allegiance. And what God is saying here is that ultimately, yeah, if I fix that, for your good, but you can make choices all that you want. We're completely free. Some of those choices are related to your destiny. Some of it is, are not. Are we going to be okay with that? And that's the proposition that the Bible gives to us. So in other words, we have 100% free will, but we also have 100% uh, God's determination. They're both true. And he does it for his glory, and he does it for our good, and it's all motivated by his love. And so, you know, I, this is just good theology, I think. You might think, well, why do I even have to know theology? I mean, I just want to be a good person. You know, I just want to have a good marriage. I want to live a good life. True, but we all have a value system that we operate on, don't we? And sometimes having good theology, something like this, really helps to reconcile all those moments in our lives we're so anxious and, and brooding over and feeling self-condemned because we made a bad decision. I said, you know what? Even if you made a bad decision and there are terrible consequences, I want to encourage you that God is still trying to work out good from that. And the ultimate, because he gets to have the final say, and if you follow him, even after those bad decisions, he's going to bring you through. That's his promise. All things work for the good of those who love him. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's just really good theology. It's good truth, and these are promises from the Lord. Now, as much as me saying that may be sources of comfort, but I, I, I want to encourage you with the word now. Like, I, I don't want to just say it to you as kind of a, you know, like, oh, oh, the speaker up front said it, so it must be good because, you know, we're at church and we have people that are listening. They seem to be nodding in agreement. Well, you always want scripture to support, especially in the work of God. It's like, where does it say in the Bible that, that we are free at the same time that God is working things out for his, for his glory and his good? And, and the first one I want to share with you is from the book of Philippians where Paul says this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. Now, I want you to, I want to draw uh, your attention to specific wordings here. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Who's doing that? That's you. It's me. 100% free. We're supposed to work out our, our salvation. I mean, try to live as, as godly lives as possible. Make some good choices. These choices are yours. These choices are mine. But then it says at the same time, it says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. So he's actually using your choices to fulfill his purposes. Isn't that cool? So you're not alone. You're not here all by yourself. It's like you're not making these random choices and like, oh, I hope God bless it. No, no, no. As you live your godly life, as you work it out, as you utilize the talents and gifts and experiences God's given to you, make good choices. That's all you, by the way. God is working through that. So it's 100% you and it's 100% God. You see that? Now, it says something similar in Acts with bigger issues. This man, Jesus, this is Peter preaching you know, his first major sermon in the New Testament. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Again, I, I want to I just draw your attention to the specifics of this passage. What we see here is that God had a deliberate plan, and he actually caused it so that Jesus would die. God was behind all that. That's what foreknowledge means. That's what it means to have a deliberate plan. But check this out. The people who killed him, the, the, the Jewish community, God still holds them responsible. <laughs> he said, no, you, you put him to death, and you nailed him on the cross. Wait a minute, you just said that you sent him to the cross, God. Peter just said that. He was like your right-hand God. Is he lying? No, he's not lying. God foreordained it. He saw it happening. He predestined it. He willed it. 
that Jesus would die on the cross for the salvation of, of the world. But people had choices, and they put Jesus on the cross, and so you see they're responsible. Do you see what I mean by biblical support for, 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 for just promises and theology in the Bible that's well supported. And by the way, this is a really good practice for you to engage in. If there are questions or statements that you have about the Bible and you're not sure about the way to live this life, look at the scriptures, examine the scriptures, and you're going to find them, and you're going to feel uh, assurance, a sense of confidence that, okay, you know what? I've always thought this was the best way to live, now I'm certain because the Bible supports it. The Bible actually uh, wants us to live this way. And here are the verses that show that and, and have a confidence about that. All right? Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm going to go a little further because some of these examples are so important. Uh, in the book of Exodus, there, there's this kind of, you know, um, uh, statements in, in the New Testament and the Old Testament about, about when the Israelites were, were, were leaving. Uh, Mo, Mo, actually, Moses was told by God that, hey, you know, tell the Pharaoh, um, you know, we're leaving, you know, tell them, tell them that, you know, you're going to take the people with, with you. And then, uh, not unbeknownst to Moses, uh, God actually hardens Pharaoh's heart, and so he doesn't let him go. Um, and that's the whole, like, let my people go thing, right? You guys are probably see Charleston Heston in, in the, is it the ten, it's not the Ten Commandments, it would be Moses, it was just a story about Moses, right? Um, anyway, and the Pharaoh goes, no, I'm not going to do that, right? And, and, the, and the story is told that God hardened his heart, or is it like, did he harden his own heart? And then when that happened, there were these unleashing of these ten plagues, uh, which was to showcase God's power over the elements. So he hardened you know, Pharaoh's heart for a reason. Now, check out this verse. Then the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you, the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So he can unleash his ten plagues. But then, then there's this other verse in Exodus chapter 8. Verse 13, then Moses left Pharaoh and prayed to the Lord, and, and the Lord did what Moses asked. The flies left Pharaoh and his, his officials and his people. Not a fly remained. But this time also, Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not let the people go. So there it is again, that, that paradox. 100% the, the human will of Pharaoh, but 100% that God did that too. And in fact, if you actually explore a little bit deeper, you find that there are 10 places where God, like uh, hardening Pharaoh's heart, is ascribed to God. There's actually 10 verses that literally say that. But then there's 10 verses that say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, right? So there, it, this is in the scriptures. So you don't have to wrestle with that tension anymore. It's 100% you and I, 100% God. But just know that when God does it, it's for our good. And in the end, he's going to get his way. In the end, he's the one that's going to fix this so that it's for our good, for his glory and our good, which is great news for us, right? Okay, now we're coming down to the, the, the wide turn here, the home stretch. Okay, how do we live with this guidance in the best possible way? Not casually, not superficially, where we have like one foot in God's economy and one foot in our, our own This is maker. What are the best ways to live with wisdom? What should be the posture of my heart so that when I make those decisions, like I'm all in. I feel like I have the support of God. I want him to know what's going on. And I, God, I'm asking for wisdom. And here's God's response that the best way to make wise decisions is with this kind of posture of heart. And here's, um, here's the statement, that God's um, guidance requires radical trust, not casual trust, but radical. That requires some sacrifice on your part, on my part. It may require us to lay our lives down. And here's uh, some support here. Uh, uh, Proverbs 16.3 says this, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, then your plans will succeed. Proverbs 16.3. Now, the Hebrew word for commit literally means to roll, kind of lean and put all your weight in it. When we commit our plans to God, we're saying, you know what, I'm all in. Okay, if this, if this doesn't work out, I'm all in. You know, I'm not going to preserve a little bit of myself so I don't look so bad. I'm all in. So commit to the Lord whatever you do, then your plans will succeed. So there it is. So the decisions that, that are set before you, uh, anything simple as like, you know, is this the school that I go to? Is this the job I take? Is this the person I let go? Do we keep this person? I mean, these are simple things that we're asking guidance for, but it, what, what this verse is saying is that the best way to make the best decisions is to commit your whole heart in the ways of the Lord, because the Lord's got the results fixed, but as you commit your heart, what you're going to find is that you're going to get wiser 
and wiser and wiser because we are all in. In other words, all of us that make decisions about life, what the Bible would say is that we need to get to the point that when we make these decisions as, as wise as we can to trust the Lord, that we're all going to get to the point and, and, and realize, what is God in this or not? So, so one axiom of the Bible is that when we commit ourselves to the Lord, we'll always get to the point where we feel like we're being abandoned by God. And then in those circumstances, we're literally hanging on at the end of the rope. It's like we need God or else. And then somehow in that, in that ultimate dependence, somehow in that kind of yielding of ourselves, this, this surrender, even though these are you know, kind of decisions, uh, casual decisions that we have to make in everyday life, there's some sense that, wow, it, has God abandoned us? Is he with us? And somehow as we go to God with that kind of attitude, the Bible says that's when we get found. That's when we actually begin to see the wisdom of like, oh, you know what, God, even though I think we ought to go this way, I realize that you're going to do what's best. So whether or not I get this job, whether or not I get this position, whether or not I do the right thing, God, I, I, I just want to make sure that I'm right with you. And there's a wisdom in that rather than like, if I don't get the result that I asked for, God, you know what? I'm not going to church anymore. If I don't get what I want, you know, God, I've given you five chances now. No more. No more. You see what I'm saying? It, there's a wisdom to say, you know, whatever the decision is, if you want me to go left and you want me to go right and I, I, I still don't get it, God, I, I just want you to know that, that you're in charge. And there's a wisdom in that. And so until we get to the point where we're abandoned, the feeling of abandonment, we're really not going to be found. We're not going to have that sense of belonging. Well, what's a biblical example of that? You see, God asked Jesus, his one and only son, to lay his life down for humanity. And there was a point, there was a point before he died, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was just anticipating what he had to go through on the cross. And he asked God for guidance if this cup of suffering could pass, but thy will be done, not mine. He asked God for guidance that if this suffering could pass. And then when he was on the cross, it was very interesting what he said. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The, the request for wisdom, the request for guidance was met with the sense that God had abandoned him. And then when he died and he rose again, what we find is that Jesus found his life by losing it, that the greatest wisdom that he could exercise was actually get to the point of following God and, and, and experience this abandonment of God as if God wasn't there. And then as he sacrificed, as he committed his ways to the Lord, the success that he found and the success that I believe that we will find is that we will be found by God and that we will grow wiser as a result. That a man who tries to gain his life will lose it but a man who loses his life for the kingdom of God will gain it. There's a wisdom in that. That as we abandon uh, ourselves, to, to, as God abandons us, and if we seemingly we've lost our life, and it feels so foolish to give everything up to follow God, there's a sense of abandonment. And Jesus felt like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? I did everything right. I, want, I did everything you want me to do. Where are you, God? And, and, and we're at the end of our rope. The, the guidance is about that rope being used to guide. And we're at the end of it. And when we get to the end of it, Somehow in the losing of our lives and feeling abandoned by God, we find our lives and there's an incredible wisdom in that. And that's the guidance for us today that whatever you're wrestling with today, whatever decision you, you need to make about your marriage, about your business, about your relationship, and you're thinking, man, I got to get this. It's got to be absolutely perfect until we get to the point. We feel like that we're being abandoned by God. We will not have the wisdom of being found and looking at these decisions with sobriety with some sense of like, you know, God, even if you don't answer these prayers, I know you're God, and I'm not. And there's a wisdom in that. He doesn't owe us anything. He's God, and we're his flock, we're his children, and that's okay. And so I hope this morning that God spoke to you, that, that as, as you move along this, this thing called life, and you're having to make really good decisions, and, and, and you're asking the wisdom of God, you're asking the guidance of God. If you haven't got to the point where you feel like God's abandoning you, you know what? Maybe God lets you cook in the oven a little longer 
Because you see, wisdom is coming. The wisdom is coming. Because once we get at the point and we say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wisdom will come and see on the other side, you see, there's a resurrection. And outside of the resurrection, the pain of what we're going through, in retrospect, we realize that we have to go through the pain to get the joy. And so for us, for me, for, for our church, I pray that we would lean into the wisdom of God, the kind of guidance that brings us to the end of the rope and forces us to depend on him and say, God, you are the wisest God. You are the most powerful God. Anchored in love, we're going to trust your wisdom. We may have free will to make the choices that we need to make, and, th and that's what we have, but I'm so grateful. We're so grateful that God's fixed the result for his glory and our good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, we love you. This is awesome that to know that you are good and wonderful, that even in the, the bad choices and the evil things that we do, in the end, what you have fixed is this bringing about good. And we wait patiently for that. And uh, we, we long for the day, God, as we make these choices, as we live in this, this real world where we have free will, we are comforted. We are comforted, God, that this cruise ship that is headed in the direction that you prefer, that you want, that on this cruise ship that we actually have free will. Thank you for that privilege, God. But thank you even more that when we mess up and we get off track, you steer us back to that fixed destination that you have for us. We praise you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.